There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's us. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Monkey Ball, brought to you by the Monkey Sports Podcast. Got a great episode on our hands today. We talked to at Raised in Baseball, Tanner Carson, the 13-year-old phenom, I guess phenom maybe is the word to use, about his social media rise and kind of his uh, career in baseball so far. Here in studio with uh, Will from Baseball Monkey. Will, how are we doing today? Not too bad. How are you? I'm doing well. Excited to be bringing you uh, this one. So, something that we talked about with Tanner that I wanted to kind of bring up and I've been thinking about for a little bit now is is the media surrounding baseball. So, obviously, baseball is a top three, I think top two major sport in the United States, but the media seems to be severely lacking. And as a company or as people that our jobs revolve around the media of baseball, it's interesting to kind of see that. So, I'm curious kind of your takes on maybe why the MLB is so stuck in like not posting highlights and not having like you think about NBA Twitter is massive it's this huge thing it's it's talked about it's almost a joke in and of itself and the MLB is bigger than that the MLB is international like there are so many opportunities for these huge media ventures that they just don't pursue and I'm curious kind of your your take on that I don't know why MLB doesn't allow that they definitely should Um, I don't know the reason behind it but yeah, I mean, it's crazy that, that they don't. Like you said, NBA, they're huge on Twitter and everything. Pretty much every other sport is. But yeah, I mean, anything you post that is an MLB game, anything like that, is just going to get taken down or copyrighted. So I don't know the reason for it, but they should definitely go in the other direction because that would get more people excited in the game. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Like, I, I have no idea why they're not doing it at this point. Yeah, you made a good point about the excitement of the game. Like, that seems to be something that baseball's kind of battling with now you know this whole like oh make baseball fun again well biggest way to do that is to obviously get this influx of youth or these people that are going to care about seeing a highlight they want to see a home run get robbed or some 600 foot you know bomb shot so it's crazy to see but I'm curious I had another kind of hot take about the same idea so like when I think of baseball media the biggest thing surrounding it is obviously the Hall of Fame vote and that's it always goes to you know baseball writers and some of the top like media members of baseball but when I think of that it's always like old heads and guys that are like these baseball purists are like oh like Derek Jeter wasn't a unanimous vote because mm-hmm. some guy in baseball media didn't think he was worthy of a first right. ballot Hall of Fame which is ludicrous to me mm-hmm. so I'm curious if you maybe agree with this take that the stories like the Astros scandal has been in the news for, I mean, we talked about it on the last podcast a month ago and that's, it's still relevant. And obviously mm-hmm. it's a big scandal, but it doesn't have like baseball doesn't have that 24 hour news cycle effect of like, then the next story happens. Then the next story, like nothing gets washed out. And I'm curious if you, if that like is a take that has legs, you think that, you know, these things stay around for so long because there's not enough supplemental media around it. Yeah, and that's definitely true, and it's also because now everyone has a voice of their own on social media. It's not directly MLB putting out their own content. It's everyone talking about the issue and the scandal, so then, you know, the commissioner has to go and actually act on it. Like, back with all the steroid stuff, there wasn't really social media to say, like, to the extent of what it is now. So, you know, you'd have to, like, send in a letter to MLB to discuss your views on on everything, and it would just kind of get washed under the rug after a while, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. They they need to definitely allow players more um, leeway on social media. I mean, some players have, have been uh, voicing their opinions and stuff on mainly the Astros scandal, but they're also being like Alex Bregman before all this stuff happened. He was kind of getting big on, on YouTube and social media, and Trevor Bauer is another one. But uh, as far as just strictly baseball game highlights and stuff like that, they definitely need to start putting those out and making them available and not take them down if someone else other than it'll be posts them up and it's not like they're short on content i mean they play 162 games Mm -hmm. a year times 30 plus all the playoffs yeah no that's something that i think is ridiculous and going into to the interview that we had with tanner it's interesting to see you know a 13 year old kid that has 60,000 followers on instagram kind of doing it for himself do you think that's kind of a niche that's starting to be exploited more that like influencer style within baseball since there is so much of a Restriction on the actual, like, what the MLB posts and doesn't post? Yeah, and, and, I mean, even, like, with these bigger baseball community influencers, they're teaming up with, um, 
manufacturers of gear and they're getting sponsors and all that stuff and like so they're kind of taking the forefront of the baseball influencer social media type um, platform whereas the players haven't really gotten into that and I, I think like the more baseball gets out into social media and allows more things, um, allows players to show their personality more um, on social media, the more the fan base will grow. And it's, I think it's kind of getting to that point, but it just needs to progress quite a bit more. Do you think there would ever be a time that the MLB just opens the floodgates and says, like, yeah, post highlights, tweet, gifts, whatever? Hopefully. I mean, I don't really know their reason behind it because, like we said earlier, like all other sports allow it for the most part, mm-hmm. so... I, I I don't know why they're not doing it yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, would be interesting to see, and definitely yeah. a way to yeah. That's how you like re-energize the game, make mm-hmm. baseball fun again. I mean, let people put highlights on, right? That's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. With that, we'll lead into our interview with uh, Tanner Carson, as we mentioned, 13-year-old baseball player, better known as at Raised in Baseball on Instagram. So, without further ado, Tanner Carson. Welcome back to the Monkey Ball Podcast. Today, Jason and I are joined by Tanner Carson or uh, Raised in Baseball on social media. Uh, Tanner, how's it going? I'm good, I'm good. How are you guys? Not doing too bad. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for hopping on with us. Yeah, yep, anytime. All right, well, I guess we'll start off. uh, For those who don't know of you, would you like to just give a little background information on yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, My name is Tanner Carson. I'm a 13-year-old baseball player from uh, South Lake, Texas, and I uh, I love to play baseball, and it's what I'm good at. So I guess uh, we'll start off kind of with the basics here. So what position do you play? I've seen that you pitch a little bit here uh, from your Instagram, but um, what other positions do you play besides pitcher, and what's your favorite? Um, I can play pretty much anywhere in the infield. I, I don't catch a lot. I like to I like to catch, but. I am not good at it, but my favorite position is uh, shortstop. I love it because uh, that's where the majority of the baseballs get hit, and I love the action over there. Yeah, definitely. I played a fair amount of shortstop in my day, so I definitely agree with you on that. Um, When did you start playing baseball? You can ask my dad, but he told me uh, me when I was three and my big brother was playing I'd always run onto the field and (laughs) you couldn't keep me off. My mom was looking, my mom would look away and I'd I'd be on the field in five seconds flat. So I've, all, I've always loved baseball, and I actually started playing probably when I was four, and I started playing competitive baseball when I was eight. So, Tanner, we'll go into a little bit of kind of why uh, why you're most known maybe from, from social media. When did you guys start running the actual account and thinking, hey, we should kind of document some of the, uh, the baseball playing that you're doing? I think it started, we, me and my dad started it when I was... Uh, I was probably eight. I think back then it was it was him. It was just him running it, and now it's kind of transitioned. Well, I'm, I'm homeschooled, so now we kind of use it as a, an English type thing. I'll do all the the descriptions and everything like that, and then they'll check it out and make sure it's good. And that's kind of my part of my English for the day. But that's uh, that's kind of when it started, and we started it because uh, I just kind of wanted to document what we were doing and uh, put some drills on there that could help some people out. Do your friends get jealous that uh, your English classes are getting to run a big social media account and not sit and uh, read books in class? Yeah, I think some of them do. But <laughs> homeschooling, homeschooling is really cool. I love having the freedom to play baseball and work out but still get my school done. I was wondering if you could kind of take us through like a typical day for you, typical week. What's your like training, schoolwork, practice, stuff like that? What does that all look like? Yeah, so I, uh, I normally wake up around 6.30, 6.15, and I'll make some breakfast around 6.30 to 6.45, and then after that it's, ba- or not baseball, but uh, school until 8.30, and then we leave to go work out, and that goes from 9 to 10. And then once we get back from that, it is school until 12.30, and then 12.30 on until 3 when we come back to pick my brother up. That's baseball, like hitting in the cage or sometimes going out to field. And then after that, I'll come home, do whatever schoolwork I have left, um, maybe do a little bit more baseball. But then after that, it's just hanging out with the family. What are some of your favorite uh, drills and things to work on when you're when you're training between school? There's a couple that I'm doing right now that helps me. I have a little bit of a problem with getting around the ball and hooking some baseballs. So 
I started doing a drill where you set the tee up where it would normally be on an inside pitch, and then you scoot it into where your front foot is when you land. And then uh, you just take a regular swing and make sure you keep your hands in and try to drive it up the middle. And if you go around the ball, you hook it. And if you uh, if you uh, push too early, like if you snap your hands too soon, then you're going to hit the ball basically behind you. So are you on a set like travel team? I noticed that um, some of your posts you'll be subbing in for another team. Do you have a set team yourself or do you just kind of travel around and play with teams wherever you are? Um, I don't really have a set team. I have I have a couple teams that I'll guest play with whenever I can, and uh, that's that's pretty much it. But the teams that I guest play with are uh, ZT Baseball from I think yeah San Antonio Texas, and then I have a team from up north, kind of by Oklahoma, called the Texoma Show, and I play with them because they practice a lot, and it's uh, good to get some reps in on the field. So that was going to be my question. Maybe explain a little bit of kind of the guest play situation for those that don't understand. So do you not practice with the team? It's just when you're available, you go play with them? Or how does that kind of work out? For the most part, uh, my dad will get a phone call from the coach and he'll ask if I'm available to play. And if I am, I'll go out there. And if it's a new team, for uh, those of you that hasn't that haven't guest played, it is, uh, it's a little different because you know absolutely nobody half the time you've never met the coach before and uh, you kind of got to try to play your best and get to know everybody around you and uh, I used to struggle with uh, not knowing anybody and I still do a little bit just it's a little bit weird going into a situation where you don't know anybody and you've got to perform. Yeah, how, how hard is that? I would imagine it would be pretty difficult, especially in a team sport where, you know, chemistry goes a long way. Yeah, um, it was it was pretty hard. I mean, it, it is hard, but that's one thing my dad and I talked about is I wouldn't be guest playing or those people wouldn't, those people wouldn't have wanted me to guest play for them if I wasn't, if, uh, if they didn't know that I, that I could hit and that I could play baseball. And that's one thing that I think about is I wouldn't be here if I couldn't play. And so that's that's what helps me um, just kind of get past it. Just realize, you know what, I'm good. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to show them what I can do. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's great. Yeah. So I've noticed that you've met a few professional baseball players, minor league players and stuff. Um, I was just wondering, who would you consider to be like the coolest player that you've met or like the coolest encounter that you've had through uh, social media? Oh, um... That's a tough one. There's a lot of really cool guys that I've, uh, one, met, two, worked out with, and three, just kind of talked with uh, over social media. But um, some of the guys that I worked out with this year, um, I worked out with Bobby Witt Jr., um, a guy named Colin Thoreau. He's a catcher for the athletics. And uh, Cody Thomas, he's a outfielder for the Dodgers and uh, a pitcher Brian Moselli, who uh, he's also on the Dodgers, Rafael Palmero and his son Preston Palmero, and that that's really cool. How important do you think that is to work with some of these professional guys and guys like Rafael Palmero uh, at such a young age? How much benefit do you think that brings to your game? I think that it helps a lot, especially when I'm working out with all those guys. It helps a lot to see, uh, like, kind of the mental side a little bit just see how much work it takes, how much work you had to put in. And uh, hitting with the Palmeros uh, is just a lot of insight. You know, those, uh, Rafael Palmero played in the league for a really long time, and he knows his stuff. And his son, Preston and Patrick, they all know their stuff. So it helps a lot to uh, have somebody in there that you can ask questions, and they'll give you the right answers. So I've seen from your page that you've uh, done some work with Bruce Bolt, the guys over there, guard and his son. Um, I was just wondering, what do you think of their gloves and how has it been working with them? Um, I personally absolutely love their gloves. Um, I used to, me and my dad would go to like Academy and we'd buy these $10 gloves that were on sale and we'd just buy like 10 pairs of them. <laughs> and that would uh, last me like maybe three months and I'd go through all 10 of them. And one, they'd stink or two, they'd rip. And uh, Bruce and Bolt gloves, since I've tried them out, I've had um, probably six six pairs, and that's lasted me pretty much two years. So if you put that in consideration with the 
10 pairs through three months, you get Bruce and Bolt gloves, and they last forever. <laughs> and they're really comfortable, too. Yeah, they definitely are. Do you like the long cuff or short cuff better? I like the long cuff gloves. Uh, I like the way they feel, and I also think, it may just be me, but I think that they help me a little bit not rolling over. Yeah, a little bit more wrist support. Yep. So what would you say your favorite brand of bat and glove to use are? Um, it kind of depends, um, but I love Rawlings gloves. Um, I've had the opportunity to try a lot of different types of gloves and different bats, and I'd say so far Rawlings is my favorite. And uh, right now I'm using a Rawlings Quattro and a Rawlings Velo, and both of those bats are really, really nice bats, and um, I just love using them. So those are my two ones. They're probably Rawlings, and uh, that's about it. Going back to the, the players that you met and stuff, um, I was wondering who was your favorite player of all time and why? And um, if you could meet any player in the game, who would it be? You know, that's a really, that's a hard one for me. Of all time, um, I, I love Adrian Beltre. He's, he was my guy growing up. He, uh, I just love the way he plays the game. Uh, really relaxed and loose and he has fun doing it. And uh, I'd say he's 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 my uh, he's my answer for both those questions. I'd love to meet Adrian Beltre, and he's uh, he's probably my all-time favorite player. Do you model your game after any one player or any kind of player? Uh, I don't try. I don't try to um, model my practice or my my uh, my play off of any player. But I'd say that I love. Um, I like to play relaxed, and I think that helps a lot. Um, going back to that guest playing thing, if you're not relaxed, you're not going to perform well. So I noticed on uh, YouTube, um, me and me and Jason saw your your video for Whistle. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. It's got quite a few views, five hundred thirty-eight thousand views. So what was that experience like? Uh, that was that was very cool. It was very professional, and I, I wasn't thinking that. It, I didn't think that. Uh, I thought they might have two camera people there and maybe a sound guy. Nope, they had a full director, two directors, a, a bunch of camera guys, and they had uh, some audio people. And it was it was very professional. It was uh, it was really cool though. There was no downtime when they were there. When we were when they were there, it was traveling from place to place, getting it all done in two days, and it uh, it was a really great experience. Do you think as you get older with stuff like that, it it's, uh, adds a little bit of extra pressure, or do you still, is that kind of why you like to play more relaxed, like you just said? I think uh, as you get older, I think it puts maybe a little bit of a target on your back, because people are like, hey, I've seen that kid. He looked good in that video, but let's <laughs> see how good he looks now sure. when we're on the field. So it might, it might put a little bit of a target on your back, but... I mean, even still, you gotta really try to play relaxed and not be like, "Oh crap, this guy's, this guy's really trying to strike me out." It's just, all right, it's just another pitcher. Let's just go hit him. And on that same note, how do you think all the uh, the social media and the videos and things like that are gonna help kind of your recruiting or your process as you continue to uh, be scouted as you get older? Um, you know, I think it'll help. I think it'll help a little bit. Um, I think I still have to be seen by actual scouts and recruiters, but I think that, um, like, if you if you search me up on Google and you type in Tanner Carson, the first thing that comes up is Instagram. So I think that'll be a good thing if uh, if anybody is interested in in me later down the road. So I think it'll help a lot. Do you think that's something that uh, a lot of younger guys like yourself should be doing at a young age to try to help that uh, that recruiting and things like that? I think that it is. Uh, it's a really good tool to have. I don't. I think that it uh, it might not be uh, necessary, but I think that it can uh, it can help a lot for younger guys as as they grow up. You can see, uh, hey, this guy this guy's got a really big work ethic. He he uh, hits every day. Like that's that's what I try to post. I post what I do, and that's. Um, it kind of shows on there. You can see I post every day, and most of it is training. So this guy's got a work ethic. He can hit pretty well, and they'll uh, they'll look at that and then go see you play. With all the Astro stuff going on right now, um, I vaguely remember, did you say you're a pretty big Astros fan? 
Uh, yeah, I am. I like the Astros, but I, I like the Rangers even more. But okay, gotcha. The Astros. I mean, I, I like them. They're a good team. So, what do you think about all this stuff going on with them and the cheating scandal and stuff? I'm sure you've been. Uh, I that. personally don't think that uh, Rob Manfred pu- punished them enough because if you think about it, if they cheated for that one year and nobody caught them, they probably cheated for the next uh, the next two years. And um, five million dollars for a team that's worth billions is uh, it's not really putting a dent in anything. And my dad and I were talking about this the other day, uh, taking taking away their first and second round draft pick in the in the draft. They can go and spend that money that they would have spent on the one and two draft pick and go over spot on a third guy. Or my hitting coach told me this: uh, they can they can go spend that in the international draft. So they can still get some really, really good guys from uh, the international draft from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and uh, places like that. So I, I don't think that they were punished enough, and uh, I don't think that uh, their apologies were really sincere. I think that they were apologizing because they got caught and not because they actually felt bad about what they were doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you had... a. Uh... Altuve and Bregman give their like 30 second apology and then um, Jim Crane basically counteract that and say it had no impact on the game so that's kind of strange what do you think about the buzzer thing and and Altuve with his alleged tattoo or not finished tattoo I think that that is BS I think that it is um, I think that it's a pretty lame excuse and they were trying to come up with uh, I think like with the Korea thing he came up with that in an interview and I think that 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 was just something he came with came up with on the spot and it doesn't really make sense and I just don't think that I don't think that one they were punished enough two I don't think that they um, they even care that they got caught and three I think that they're coming up with things just so they can uh, make this thing go away to, to change gears a little bit, you kind of got me thinking about this when you mentioned the the uh, international draft. What's been the coolest your coolest on field baseball experience? Whether that be getting to travel for tournaments or you know a specific play, is there anything that stands out to you as as one of the coolest things you've gotten to do so far? Um, there was one thing that was really cool. I got to I got to go to uh, Globe Life Field and get a tour with Trevor Bauer. Uh, he's on the Reds now. He was on the Indians at the time, mm-hmm. but. He took me all around the stadium, let me go on the field, see how everything works, and uh, that was probably one of the coolest experiences I've had just at a baseball field. But playing-wise, when I was in North Carolina for uh, USA base, uh, USA Baseball Futures Invitational, uh, it was a championship game with two outs, and uh, the guy hit a ball, was playing third base, and he hit it in between the shortstop and me, and I made a diving catch to end the game. and. That was really cool. That's probably my favorite on-field, on-field experience. Are you excited for uh, the new Globe Life Stadium? I am. I think that uh, I think it'll be a lot better to go to in the summer. Um, <laughs> but Absolutely. I think that I think that they should have waited a little bit for the Globe Life, uh, the actual Globe Life Park, to to stay. I don't think they should have moved on from it that quickly, but. It's all right. We got a new field, new chapter, and I think it'll be a good season for the Rangers. You got any predictions on how they're going to finish up? Um, that's kind of tough for right now, but I think they're going to do really well this season. I we think they'll at least go to the wild card game, if not, hopefully the playoffs. But I'm not sure if they're going to win the World Series or not. <laughs> Maybe in a few years. Yeah, it's it's still early to tell. What would you say your long-term and short-term goals are with uh, baseball? Um, right now, for short-term goals, I'm trying to get faster. Um, I've never been a, uh, a fast kid, and um, I'm trying to get faster. And another short-term goal of mine is to um, do more mirror work. That's one thing that I do. You get in the mirror, it's a full-body mirror, and you just um, get in front of it and practice uh, practice your swing, get some form down, and it pays dividends. You get so much, so much better without actually having to swing a bat. And uh, long-term goals, um, I want to keep on getting good grades throughout um, 
middle school and throughout high school and hopefully get drafted or go to college somewhere. Uh, who would you consider to be your biggest influence in life, baseball mainly? Kind of dive into that a little bit. Uh, yeah. So I'd say um, going back to Beltre, now that he's retired, I've uh, I've kind of been watching Miguel Cabrera because to me, Beltre and him are similar um, with the way that they play the game. And I think that um, just having that mindset of relax, have fun, has helped me a lot because if you think about it, if you're going up to the plate trying to be like, oh gosh, I got to get a hit right here, otherwise I'm going to sit the bench. Instead of thinking that, if you think, all right, here we go, another pitch, and I'm going to hit a double in the gap. You know, it's it's a lot easier to play like that than it is to be tight and and um, not not um, not perform there. So that's this uh, probably the people that have the biggest influence me in baseball and. Uh, my dad, he he helps me out a lot with the baseball side, and I'm really grateful for what he's done for me, and um, he's he's a really big influence on me, too. You got anything else, Jason? Yeah, last thing for me, um, do you have any kind of tips or anything that you want to tell people to that are uh, maybe in a similar position trying to continue to improve their baseball or even tips with, uh, with the social media side? Um, well, for baseball, um, I can tell you that one thing that will get you better in baseball and in everything is working hard at it and doing it consistently. If you uh, if you play baseball and you, say, go to the cage once a week, um, to me that's that's not really enough and you need to do, I would do more than, uh, I, w- I would do what you think is more than enough to, um, to get better and to uh, succeed in baseball. And, I think that if you have a a solid work ethic and you uh, do that consistently, then I think that it'll help you out a lot in baseball and and other things. That's that's pretty much it in baseball. And then um, for social media, I get asked all the time, how'd you get so many followers? How'd you do all this? How'd you do that? It's hashtags, in my opinion. If you use the right hashtags, there's people that follow those hashtags and I'm sure all the I'm sure you guys know and uh, a lot of these all of these bigger accounts know that you need to use the right hashtags because I know uh, when you're typing in hashtags it tells you how many people follow them and like baseball I want to say has like 8 million people following it so if you put that in there there's a chance that probably 8 million people or maybe even less probably more less than that but a big chunk of that 8 million people are going to be looking at your post. So I would use the right hashtags and uh, try to get into contact with the right people and uh, your social media. I think I think it will grow. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we got. Uh, Tanner, thanks for coming on. Keep up the good work, and good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. thanks, Tanner. See ya. Thanks again to Tanner Carson for uh, joining us on episode two of the Monkey Ball Podcast. You can check him out on social media, uh, mainly Instagram, at raised underscore in underscore baseball. Uh, Thanks again, Tanner. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Monkey Ball on the Monkey Sports Podcast. We will be back for another episode of Monkey Ball on March 20th. Uh, next week, we're going to be on the Monkey Sports Podcast with Off the Ice, the official Hockey Monkey Podcast. So make sure you tune into that if you're a hockey fan or no one. Get them subscribed to the Monkey Sports Podcast. But until then, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to stay subscribed to the Monkey Sports Podcast, and we'll see you next time.